Rock music in the late 90s was dominated by a mix of grunge, slacker rock, and industrial rock, with bands like Foo Fighters, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Nine Inch Nails at the forefront. However, a new wave was emerging in the underground scene, one that would go on to become known as the Garage Rock Revival, or Post-Punk Revival, but I like to call it the New Rock Revolution. Hey, if you enjoy watching fascinating stories about your favorite artists, make sure you subscribe. I've also made a Spotify playlist featuring all of the artists I talk about in this video. It's all in the box below. The uprising of the revolution began with Detroit rockers The White Stripes and their self-titled debut record. The husband-wife duo adopted a back-to-basics approach that was influenced by the country blues of Sunhouse and Detroit's garage rock scene. It carried what would become the band's signature setup, Jack White's wailing vocals, anthemic power chords, and Meg White's primal drumming. <laughs> It was the blueprint they would only improve upon. It just wouldn't get much attention outside of Detroit, Michigan. Meanwhile in Sweden, a little band called The Hives were still finding their footing with their straightforward approach to garage rock. Almost a year following their debut, the members of the White Stripes divorced, but it didn't mean the end of the band. They would instead present themselves as siblings and soon return with their second record, Day Still. Their sophomore record showcased a greater diversity in their sound, with catchier hooks and cleaner production. Blending their garage rock elements with more blues rock, their sophomore record saw them tuning their style into the sound they would later become giants for. But outside of a few music blogs, the White Stripes were still Detroit's best kept secret. A fresh, albeit familiar, brand of rock music was surfacing. The Strokes had been practicing, rehearsing, and playing their retro-punk tunes in New York for two years now. They'd secure a weekly gig playing a 14-song set at New York's Mercury Lounge. After a recording guy handed them his card one night, offering to record one of their demos at a discounted rate, they seized the opportunity. Within three days and with an investment of only $600, the modern AGP was born. Their next move was to send it to Rough Trade Records in the UK, who recognized its potential and helped to launch it to the world in January 2001. A month later, the White Stripes were already busy writing and recording their third record, White Blood Cells. Completed in less than three weeks, they'd even score their first network TV appearance. But again, the world hardly paid them any attention. Meanwhile, the Stroke CP ignited a hype machine and a bidding war. After signing with RCA Records, the band started recording their first album by doing live takes at a basement studio in New York. The album was released in staggered intervals worldwide, with Australia getting it in July, Japan and the UK in August, and the US finally receiving it in October. The album not only met, but exceeded expectations, setting a new standard for guitar-driven music and paving the way for a musical revolution. <laughs> Its raw and energetic approach captivated audiences, rapidly gaining popularity and spreading like wildfire across the globe. Of course, the Strokes needed an opening band, and that usually came in the form of the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, who sounded like this, but also like this. With the subsequent success of the Strokes, music executives began looking to the underground for great rock music. Rough Trade Records signed London band The Libertines, Matador Records sought out the post-punk New Yorkers Interpol, and Capitol Records scooped up Australians The Vines. The White Stripes would join the fray signing to major label V2 Records, who would re-release White Blood Cells in 2002. The White Stripes would finally receive their commercial breakthrough thanks to their rock simplicity and consistency. The album peaked at number 61 on the Billboard 200, while Fell in Love with a Girl wound up becoming a minor hit thanks to its Lego animated music video. With Turn On The Bright Lights, Interpol ushered in the beginnings of a post-punk revival, bringing a melancholic atmosphere to the revolution. Right 
the Libertines were living the rock and roll lifestyle, making a name for themselves and playing gigs alongside the likes of the Strokes. They were spearheading the movement for the UK, using English slang and elements of British life in their music. With former member of The Clash Mick Jones producing their debut record, the band was about to become the force to be reckoned with, just as long as co-frontman Pete Doherty could get a hold of his growing drug addiction. Tell me what can you want me? By the end of 2002, the White Stripes and the Strokes were being hailed for bringing a new raw simplicity back to rock and roll. The White Stripes wasted no time in capitalizing on their success, launching Elephant in April of 2003, which included the global anthem Seven Nation Army. The album showcased the band's full potential, with both heartfelt moments and electrifying stadium anthems. It soared to the top of the charts, debuting at number one in the UK and number six in the US. Elephant went on to earn the Grammy Awards for Best Alternative Album and Best Rock Song, solidifying the band's position as a leader in the revolution. The White Stripes' widespread popularity was evident through their appearance on magazine covers and their inclusion on year-end best of lists. The Yeah Yeah Yeahs released their debut, and they still sounded like this. But also a little more like this. Meanwhile, the literal family members in Kings of Leon were reviving the southern rock genre with youth and young manhood. The garage rock revival found a sanctuary in New York, and alongside it, a burgeoning dance punk movement was also emerging. This was partially due to the efforts of DJs Tim Goldsworthy and James Murphy, who had produced the Rapture's energetic debut album, Echoes. That same month, Australians Jet got in on the action with their debut record. One, two, three, take my hand and come with me because you look so fine that I really want to make you mine. After conquering the music scene with their debut Is This It, the Strokes were ready to take on the world once again. To help them do just that, they brought on board the legendary producer Nigel Godrich, famous for his work with Radiohead. But things didn't go as planned, and the band quickly realized that the collaboration had turned soulless. In the end, they had no choice but to scrap the sessions and return to their original producer in crafting Room on Fire. The Strokes showcased their musical prowess with another solid collection of tracks, proving that their success wasn't just a fluke. The Strokes capstoned a monumental year for the revolution, but a second wave was incoming. Scottish newcomers Franz Ferdinand were the first to take the year by storm with their rhythmic dance punk debuts. Host to one of the most recognizable hooks of the movement, the album would go on to snag the prestigious Mercury Music Prize later that year. After failing to capture attention at home in Las Vegas, the Killers found solace in the UK, delivering the synth-pop-centric Hot Fuss. Legend has it that the band scrapped most of their original material after hearing the strokes Is This It in 2001, perhaps for the best. Hot Fuss was loaded with hit singles, making it a commercial success that sold millions of copies worldwide and became a classic album of the era. After extensively touring, the Hives finally returned to Sweden to deliver their refined sound on Tyrannosaurus Hives. Following the success of their first studio album, the Libertines started working on their second release. However, co-frontman Pete Doherty had relapsed into drug addiction, causing strain on the band's relationships once again. Although the album was completed and released before the end of the year, Pete was once again banned from performing with the Libertines until he could manage his addictions. Pete chose to focus on his side project Baby Shambles instead. With no reconciliation in sight, co-frontman Carl chose to dissolve the Libertines. Continuing to carve out their own lane, Interpol showed some great maturity with their brighter follow-up antics. Canada's Death From Above debuted their noisy dance punk tunes. Baby, 
and Kings of Leon continued to build on their southern infused garage rock. But then came Arcade Fire, disrupting the scene with their chamber pop debut. Funeral was a highly ambitious album that incorporated a wide range of influences, including art rock, chamber pop, and post-punk, and featured a large ensemble of musicians playing a variety of instruments. Its grandiose sound was the complete opposite of a back-to-basics approach that helped to inspire a wave of new indie rock bands who sought to push the boundaries of the genre. In 2005, New York DJ James Murphy donned the moniker LCD Sound System, releasing his dance punk debut that was more dance than punk. Block Party soon arrived with their fresh and energetic debut, incorporating a variety of electronic and digital techniques to create a sound that was both raw and polished. Formerly known as Parva, the now rebranded Kaiser Chiefs debuted with their album Employment, showcasing the band's knack for writing infectious sing-along choruses. After quitting their day jobs, The National had signed to an indie label to release their introspective third record, Alligator. Widely considered their first great record, it set the band on course to become one of the most adored indie acts of the decade. Then the White Stripes delivered their fifth studio album, Get Behind Me Satan. Shaking up their usual guitar-heavy sound, the duo opted for more piano-driven melodies, acoustic guitars, and even a marimba. Widely considered their weakest release to date, it would still claim the Grammy for Best Alternative Album that year. But as the spotlight shone on their latest release, something was brewing behind the scenes. Jack White was quietly forming a new band. Franz Ferdinand were quick to turn around and deliver their second studio release, attempting to move beyond their signature disco beat guitar sound. Meanwhile, The Strokes released their third studio record, First Impressions of Earth. The album represented a turning point in The Strokes' career, as the band began to experiment with new sounds and styles, but it garnered the band their harshest criticisms yet, mainly due to a bloated and lackluster track list. While it was their highest charting album to date, it spent much less time on the charts than previous albums. As 2005 drew to a close, the new rock revolution remained vibrant, with established and emerging bands delivering noteworthy releases. However, it was also evident that the movement was progressing, and groups were venturing into fresh sounds and other genres. Everything was about to change when the Arctic Monkeys released their debut album in January 2006. Arctic Monkeys drew inspiration from the Strokes' simple sound and catchy guitar riffs, while also infusing their own style into their music. The album was seen as a fresh and exciting take on rock music, combining punk and indie rock with witty and observational lyrics that spoke to the experience of young people in Britain. The band's arrival also marked a shift in how music was shared and promoted, as it coincided with the beginning of the internet age in music discovery. As a result, the album quickly became the fastest selling debut in British history. Meanwhile, in the scorching summer heat of Nashville, Tennessee, two friends, Jack White and Brendan Benson, found themselves in an attic jamming together. It was there that they created a single that would spark a new musical venture, one that would become the Rack on Tours. Unlike White's other project, The White Stripes, the Rack on Tours delved into a more eclectic mix of genres, from country to psychedelic rock. The band's unique sound and undeniable chemistry quickly gained them a devoted following, and with rumors of The White Stripes disbanding, the Rack on Tours' emergence fueled even more speculation. The Killers would return later in the year, trading their synth pop glamour for a more sentimental Heartland rock record. But the Fratellis showed that there was still room for a good old-fashioned garage rock anthem. (laughs) 
LCD Sound System covered their entire studio in tinfoil, leading even further into their electronic dance elements for Sound of Silver. Arcade Fire were criticized for being overly ambitious with their darker sophomore effort Neon Bible. And the Arctic Monkeys were quick to capitalize on their success with the energetic favorite Worst Nightmare. Along with releases from The National, Interpol, and Modest Mouse, the lines between Revival and the all-encompassing label of indie rock began to blur. The curtains closed on a momentous chapter in The Strokes' career as they wrapped up their longest tour ever. Yet as the final note rang out, the band members knew it was time for a significant break. Together, they agreed that a hiatus was necessary. And so for the next five years, The Strokes would go dark leaving fans eagerly anticipating their return to the spotlight. Later that year, the White Stripes returned to the group's signature sound with an added layer of experimentation in Icky Thump. Adding trumpets, bagpipes, and even a synthesizer, the band had reached full maturity in sound. The album skyrocketed to number two on the Billboard 200 and won a Grammy for Best Alternative Album. Unfortunately, Meg's growing anxiety resulted in the cancellation of most of their tour, and with her lack of interest in continuing the band, Icky Thump marked their final studio album. Jack White would go on to have a solo career of his own, exploring a range of genres from blues and rock to country and folk, while still maintaining the Stripe's signature sound and raw energy. I cover his entire discography in a video on Nebula, my streaming service. This is where my creative friends and I get together to have fun and experiment with unique content that you won't find anywhere else. One time Jack recorded, pressed, and then released a live version of Lazaretto in less than four hours, breaking the Guinness World Record for the fastest released record. Now he's just showing off. So if you're looking for something fresh and new, I highly recommend giving Nebula a try. For less than three bucks a month, you'll get access to my track breakdowns, my significantly different series, and a whole bunch of other cool content from other creators. Stairway to Heaven is an epic song in every sense of the word. And now with the added bonus of Nebula classes, you can learn from your favorite creators as they teach you how they create. Whether you're an aspiring content creator or just love peeking behind the curtain, Nebula has something for everyone. And when you sign up using my link, not only will you get access to all of this great content, but you'll also be supporting Middle 8 directly. You can check it out at nebula.tv forward slash middle 8. Link is below. I'll also link it at the end of the video. With tentpole acts, the strokes, and the white stripes bowing out in the same year, the new rock revolution that had dominated the early 2000s began to come to a close. While the early part of the decade had seen a resurgence of interest in guitar-based rock music, by mid-2007, the scene was starting to splinter and evolve in new directions. New subgenres and scenes were emerging, such as the indie folk movement led by bands like Fleet Foxes and Bonnie Vare. Additionally, rock music was facing increased competition from other genres, particularly electronic music and hip-hop, which were becoming increasingly popular with younger audiences. The rise of streaming services and the decline of album sales were also starting to have an impact on the music industry as a whole. But rock didn't all of a sudden disappear. It just went further underground. With its enduring popularity and enduring relevance, rock music remained a force to be reckoned with, poised to continue producing groundbreaking and influential music for years to come. You can check out my video on Jack White on the right, or if you want deeper dives on some of the artists that I've mentioned in this video, check out the playlist on the left.